My father's Hungarian and a survivor of the war. My mother's Maltese. They met on a ship coming from Canada to Australia. Both my parents were born in Malta. Some of our family had migrated from Malta to Australia and we followed. I grew up on a farm at St John's Park and then moved to County Vale where my parents built their first home and remain. We met in our last years of high school. One of my girlfriends had told me about one of her friends who had sexy legs and we used to giggle. <laughs> she had an 18th birthday party and I finally got to meet Ollie. After having quite a few too many drinks that night, I followed Rose around all night. Uh, next day, not remembering too much, I had to ring and apologise, and that was the beginning of our story. I was 20, and Ollie was 21, when we got married. Before we got married, we had to go and see Father Gat. He took us into his office, and he said to us, tell me a little bit about your family. And I piped up and I said, Father, my mum and dad are divorced. They're both, they're friends, but they're divorced. My brother's divorced. Ollie's brother's divorced. And he looked at us both and he said, you two have got no hope, haven't you? <laughs> and we both laughed. Dijon was the firstborn of our three sons. He was a very inquisitive child, always asking why this and why that. I remember one day while we were watching TV with him lying on my chest, he looked up at me and said, Dad, he said, why is your chest going up and down? So I had to explain to Dujon the mechanics of breathing and how when I breathed in, my lungs would fill with air and my chest would expand. And sitting there watching him, I could hear his breathing getting louder and a bit more anxious. And he looked up to me after I asked him, I said, Dujon, are you OK? He looked up at me and he said, Daddy, he said, I'm scared I might forget to breathe. Dujon was always making us laugh. He would dance around and sing around the house with his crazy Dujon glasses he painted with liquid paper. He would model his new clothes up and down. He'd strut up and down the hallway. Um, he was just crazy. He was always making us laugh. He studied graphics at Enmore, Enmore TAFE and he was really artsy. Dujon and I had a passion for the stock market so we used to stay up all night trading on the American market. We'd drink coffee, chat, giggle. Um, as much as he loved his graphic design, he really wanted to pursue his interest in business studies. When our younger son Laurent started dancing, Dujon and his brother Zeke realised that the dance studio was a smorgasbord full of young girls. This is where Dujon met his first girlfriend, Kaylee. Dujon and Cameron started to plan their first European vacation. We gave them a huge bon voyage party. They travelled through Europe. Dujon absolutely loved Italy and Malta. He sent me an email one day from Italy and in the email he says, were eating pippies with spaghetti underneath the Mediterranean sunset. He said, it's so romantic, I'm waiting for Cameron to propose to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was douche. He gave us a phone call from Spain. he just finished the bull run. I could hear in his voice, he was so excited. I could just picture his handsome face all sweaty and hot and tanned. From, Mal from Spain, he went to Greece. They both headed to Greece. I was, on one, I was on my way home from work one afternoon and I received a call from Cameron's father explaining to us that our boys had been attacked in Greece. The reports that we got from Greece were very sketchy. We were told that Dujon had passed away. Minutes later, we were told he wasn't. It was a parent's worst nightmare. Motion set in. I took up smoking straight away. After 30 long hours from plane to plane, my brother, myself and Cameron's dad had arrived in Greece. This is where I realised how serious things were. There was an announcement on the plane, if all passengers could please remain seated and could the Zamet party make their way up. When we got to the front of the plane, we were actually met by two embassy officials from Australia and the Greek police. We were escorted off the plane, driven across the tarmac to the back of the airport. We walked up a long corridor and I noticed all the staff were standing either side with their heads bowed. 
I wasn't feeling good. I turned around to the NBC official and I said, am I taking my son home alive? And his reply was no, there's no hope. Dujon and Cameron's last stop before coming home was the Greek island of Mykonos. They met up with some Aussies there that were Cameron's friends. They all went to the Tropicana nightclub and around 11 o'clock they were all exhausted so they headed home. Cameron's friend offered Dujon and himself a lift on a quad bike. When they got on they realised that the quad bike wasn't designed for four people and decided to get off and walk the rest of the way home. When they made it up the hill, a four-wheel drive came screeching to a halt. Four large men jumped out yelling out, police, police. The boys stopped, obviously, but realised they were in trouble because they knew these people weren't police. They were actually wearing Tropicana t-shirts. They were security from the club. They were searched and bailed up against the sandstone wall. Before Dujon left on his trip, Ollie and I had specifically told him that if he gets into any sort of trouble to hand over whatever they wanted, we'd send him whatever he needed, but just to keep safe. And that's exactly what the boys did. They handed over their wallets, they handed over their phones. They realised this was not good enough for these guys. They actually gave them their wallets and phones back. All they kept on demanding was their passports. Where's your passports? The boys knew they were in trouble. They'd left them locked away in their hotel room. They didn't have them with them. With no passports at hand, one of the pumped up men pulled out an extendable baton and started to beat our boys. It was a brutal attack. Dujon was left with severe brain damage. He was taken to a medical centre and left unattended for four hours before they airlifted him to the mainland. I sit in silence and often wonder if he'd had attention immediate attention, would he still be with us now? I have ter terrible memories of those first hours in hospital, sitting beside Dujon, watching the machines and the respirators, keeping him going. And I sat there and reminisced about this little boy that looked up at his daddy saying, I'm scared, I'm gonna stop the breathe. There was this nurse, oh, sorry, this doctor, female doctor. She took me aside and she took me under her wing and she actually started explaining to me how 10 years prior she had lost her son in, a, in an accident and how she had donated his eyes. This reminded me that Dujan was an organ donor. And I said to the doctor, I said, I can't, I know what you're asking. She said, no, I'm not asking you for anything. I just want you to listen to my story. I said to the doctor, look, I cannot make this decision by myself. I had to ring up Australia and talk to Rose. I said, no, I was grief stricken and my total being was consumed with sadness. I knew that to say yes meant giving up all hope of bringing Dujon back home. Ollie reminded me of a conversation we'd had six months earlier, a family discussion. We wanted to make the boys aware that Ollie and I were organ donors. Dujon had then told us that his licence was signed and that he was also a donor. Ziki and Laurent also told us that they wanted to be donors as well. I knew at this time in my heart that I had to let go and give that hope to another family, and I did. Once we had agreed to donate Dujon's organs, we had to decide which organs we were going to make available for transplantation. We knew this is what Dujon wanted. And this also gave Dujon the last say. At the time in Greece, they had the, uh, the lowest rates of organ transplantation in Europe. So it didn't take long to make a connection in between the recipients and who the donor was. 60 Minutes actually covered our story and flew us, flew us back. We got to meet three of the four recipients. This is something that we want to do as a family, but we just didn't have any idea how difficult that was going to be. Ollie and I and our two boys, Ziki and Laurent, flew back to Greece to meet the recipients. We could see in their eyes how difficult this was for them, that they felt a sense of guilt, knowing that for their second chance of life, we had lost Dujon. And they could see how sad it was for us, even though we really wanted to meet them. One person we met was Costa, Dujon's heart recipient. 
It had only been six weeks since we, Dujon had passed away and, du, and Rosemary had a favour to ask us Costa, but too embarrassed to ask. So I asked Costa, would you mind if Rose felt Dujon's beating heart in your chest? Of course he agreed and it was a beautiful moment. This gave us a sense of comfort. Costa and his wife Poppy have now moved to Australia and have twins. This was such a crazy time for us, feeling so surreal. There was a little voice inside of me that said, right Rose, keep a journal, and I did. I used to cry, I'd laugh, and I'd reminisce. Our life experiences have now been released as a book called Dujon's Heart. We were located by our local Liverpool mayor who had heard a Dujon story. He said we should name something after Dujon to honour him and also to raise awareness for organ donation. This is where the lake where Dujon grew up became Dujon Lake. The mayor continued on to tell us that he was a living donor and his son needed a kidney from birth, but he had to wait two years until his son got strong enough to actually receive the kidney. Ollie and I do whatever we can to promote organ donation. Dujon's donation has given life and, better, and a better quality of life to four human beings. And it has brought meaning to our tragedy. Thank you. <laughs>